Now for today's program. Justice Stephen Breyer served as a law clerk in 1964 to Supreme Court Justice Arthur Goldberg. He then held numerous public service positions in the United States government and was a professor at Harvard Law School and the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. In 1980, President Carter appointed him to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the First Circuit. And in 1994, President Clinton nominated Judge Breyer as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, where he served for 28 years until retiring in 2022. Justice Breyer is now the Byrne Professor of Administrative Law and Process at Harvard Law School, and his latest book is Reading the Constitution, Why I Chose Pragmatism, Not Textualism. Also joining us today is Robert Siegel. Robert was the senior host of NPR's award-winning evening news magazine, All Things Considered, for 30 years. He was awarded the Edward Murrow Lifetime Achievement Award in Journalism and has been honored with three silver batons from Alfred I. DuPont Columbia University, as well as the American Bar Association Silver Gavel Award. Robert is a special contributor to Moment Magazine and serves on the advisory board for Moment's Daniel Pearl Investigative Journalism Initiative. Please welcome Justice Stephen Breyer and Robert Siegel. Thank you. Thank you. Justice Breyer, uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. And uh, during the, this hour, I hope that we'll hear uh, both about your, your ideas about, about the law and also about your life, perhaps. Uh, yeah. But I'd like to start with something which isn't your idea of how uh, one should reason on the bench. Uh, and that is the, uh, the ism that figures in the title of your book, or the first ism that figures in the title of your book, textualism. Uh, you are you are not a textualist, and your book is in many respects, in many ways, a rebuttal, a response to to this idea. What is this idea? What what does it mean to reason by text? Well, the idea basically is that we can interpret statutes in the Constitution best by simply looking at the words and asking what would those words have meant to an ordinary person at the time that they were written and go no further. Uh, if you're a more extreme textualist, you will say, and you know, Scalia said, go no further. Mm -hmm. Do not look to some of the things that I would certainly look to, and I think many judges have. When you have a difficult phrase, who wrote it? Mm -hmm. What did they mean? What was the mischief they were after? What were they trying to do? And there are many ways of trying to find that out. Or you might look at consequences. If I decide this way, what will happen? Or the other way, what will happen? And uh, I might uh, want as well to look at values. This document, the Constitution, after all, contains values, democracy, mm -hmm. human rights, equality, separation of powers, rule of law, basic things that were put there in 1788, 89, and that were meant to stay there for a long time. So the opposite view is look at a lot of things. Mm -hmm. and, uh, indeed, Chief Justice Marshall, I have it here, said in, uh, when in, I think, I don't know, for pretty 18, close to 19, the time, the Constitution, so his, his, in his words, he says, when the mind labors to discover the design of the legislature, after all, they passed these words into law and the statutes, it seizes everything <laughs> from which aid can be derived. Mm -hmm. In other words, there are lots of things you look at. Now, and textualism. Textualist wants to look really at just one. Looking there. Uh, there's a related approach to constitutional articles and amendments, originalism, which says, well, let's look at what the authors of that article or that amendment uh, had in mind when. Uh, uh, when they wrote that, uh, textualism and original and originalism both seem to have uh, uh, an allure, perhaps a false one, but an allure of of, of simplicity. Uh, that uh, this is a clear cut, um, methodical way of of arriving at at Supreme Court. Uh, yes, I think they make some promises, and I think that's their attraction. And I think before this century they weren't very attractive, but now mm -hmm. they are. And they say, well, we have promises for you. One, our method is simple. Two, it will always produce the same answers. Three, that will make it easy for Congress to uh, compromise or to write whatever they want because they know what the courts will say. And four, uh, it will prevent judges from substituting their own view 
of what's good from what the law requires, which is what we want in a democracy. Now, you hear those promises, and if you go no further, you think, well, this is great. And a lot of people do. Well, great for what? To solve certain problems. What are the problems? You, you want to know an example? I can give you an example. Okay. If you like of what we do in the Supreme Court, and I will give you and any listeners exactly the same example that I use for, to talk to fifth graders. The fifth graders like it, <laughs> and it's absolutely clear, and it is simple. Is this about the snails I, that we're going to Yes. Use? Yes. If you want me to. Yes, go ahead. Well. The snails are great. Because I, I, it's absolutely true. I read, I, was, I read a French newspaper, and in the paper was the story of a French biology teacher who was traveling from Nantes to Paris, and he was bringing 20 live snails. Mm -hmm. And he had those snails in a basket. Next to his seat, the uh, conductor came up, looked in the basket and said, what's that, snails? He said, well, have you bought a ticket for the snails? The biology teacher said, See, by this time, the fifth graders are paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> See, the, the, uh, by this time, now they want to know. Well, uh, the biology teacher says, what are you talking about? He says, well, read the fair book. Here's the fair book. See, it says no animals on the train unless they're in a basket and you've bought a ticket, half fare ticket. So he says, but, I mean, really, um, they're talking about dogs <laughs> or cats or who knows, maybe a rabbit but certainly not snails. So I say to the class, all right, who do you think is right? And some of them say, well, a snail is an animal. So somebody else says, well, you think you have to pay a half fare for a mosquito? What about a fly or what about some kind of a bug? Or I mean, it's ridiculous. They don't mean that. And then the other side goes back and says, well, it's an animal, isn't it? So I say, great, I don't have to stay. I don't have to say another word. They'll take over from there. And they will argue for half an hour or 20 minutes on this. And, and I can say, well, that's what we do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I judge in an appeals court. And uh, I'm not saying we talk about snails all the time. I don't think we ever have. But it's the same kind of a problem. Right, right. The and you would... freedom of speech. What does that word, what do those words mean? And how do they apply? Same as animals. I mean, it's not the same as animals, but the form of the question is the same. The well, you would right say the to judge, bear arms. You would say that the, the wise judge uh, would inquire as to what kind of animals were, uh, were being discussed when the fare structure was set for animals on trains, for example. That, that would be a... Yes, that, that might, might, that might that give, be, be a help. Do you wonder, did they really mean snails to be included? And uh, what were they thinking of? And why did they put this thing in about animals in a, in a basket right. and paying half fare? What was their purpose? What right. were they trying to do? I, I, I understand the, the, uh, the difference between textualism or originalism and the pragmatism that you, uh, that you would uh, advocate, which you've already described as using many different tools to examine the, the, the questions that come before you on, on the bench. Exactly. Uh, the, the, the title of your book or the subtitle of Reading the Constitution is Why I Chose Pragmatism, Not Textualism, which implies that there was a moment of choice here. Uh, is, is there some point uh, when you, you decided, uh, uh, perhaps even tempted by the, the allure of the simplicity of, of, of textualism, was there some moment when you decided, no, that's not what I'm that's not what I'm about as a judge? Or is this looking back on your own actions, how you summarize them? Both. I mean, I, I think that uh, if I go back, I mean, I was a judge on the Court of Appeals for mm -hmm. about, no, oh, 12, 13 years and then 28 years on the Supreme Court. That's about 40 years. That's quite a long time. I said, I've always saw, and my professors at Harvard Law School, Hart, Hart and Sachs, they, they more or less had uh, decide, thought we should decide questions the way I've described it, difficult mm -hmm. questions of law. And you can go back and trace this, uh, Holmes and Cardoza and Brandeis and mm -hmm. Learned Hand and go back to John Marshall. And so you can say, well, why write this book? That's the obvious way everybody's more or less done it. 
And I say because this textualism has come along and become very popular. Uh, and uh, if if you uh, if it's if it's just coming in taking over, I could say, well, when other members, not all the other members, but maybe two or three on the Supreme Court are really strong textualists, and I, if I went along with them, may, maybe I get more agreement. Why shouldn't <laughs> yeah. I do it the way they're doing it? So mm -hmm. it's both a, a long history of, of how you learn to decide things and what experience teaches you. And it's also that this wave is coming along. And so uh, when I had to think about it, and I wrote this book because I had been thinking about it, and, mm -hmm. and I think it's not. It, it's a wave, but it isn't helpful. <laughs> so I'd <laughs> like people to see the other side. Right. What, what do you say to a, a critic, this is perhaps a cynical critic, who says, uh, while the methods that are now uh, popular with some of your, your, your former colleagues on, on, on the bench uh, may be different and may be uh, narrow, uh, their methodology and the, the way that they reason is less important than political positions that they bring to the bench. That is, when, but when Donald Trump brags I, I ended Roe versus Wade, he says, meaning I appointed three justices who gave the majority to the undue uh, Wade side. Uh, he, he doesn't care, I don't think, whether they're textualists or originalists or whatever they might be. They're votes against abortion. Uh, and, uh, and I'm just wondering whether, um, wh wh where that figures, where, where the, the, the personal convictions of a justice entering the court, uh, where, that, where that figures in, 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 with respect to methodology. Yeah, I mean, that's a very good question. Because if I'm talking about the book to an audience, Mm -hmm. um, whether they're students or, or whether they're lawyers or whether they're not, they're very tempted. There'll be a, probably a, a big majority in that audience who think, oh, no, it's all politics, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just politics. This is just window dressing, however you do it. And I wrote this in part because I want to say, look, I have been a judge for 40 years. And in my experience, it's not all politics. Mm -hmm. The role of politics is minor. It's major in deciding who will be appointed. That is probably, and there I'm not sure because I didn't do the appointing. I was the appointed person. I was not the appointing person. That was the right. president. The confirming per people were the Senate. Right. And so asking me about that is sort of like asking for the recipe for chicken a la king from <laughs> the point of view of the chicken. <laughs> but... I still have a view on that, and I think politics plays a big role. So groups that are interested in politics have looked around. They, if they're interested in the judiciary, they will look around at judges all across the country and people in the legal field, and they will come up with a few that they think that one of those people, if appointed, mm -hmm. will decide cases in ways that we think are the better politics, which we like politically. Mm -hmm. They're sometimes wrong on that. Mm -hmm. They're not always right about that at all, but they think that. All right. But the judge, when he's de or deciding the case, well, he thinks or she thinks that they're deciding it for reasons of law on jurisprudential grounds, on the basis of approaches that don't have much to do with politics. And that, I think, is important, both to show that, because that's pretty much how the courts work. Pretty much is when you draw the curtain back and you see what's happening inside and you see, now I see behind, where is the Wizard of Oz? Let's see what really goes on. What you see is nothing, nothing, is nothing that goes on that's right. really very different from what you read in the opinions which become perfectly public. That I have a ways to go to convince people that's true yeah. because there are a lot of things that are sort of like politics but aren't politics, which are part of the judge's job. Well, also one thing that your that your book reminds us of is that there are relatively few Supreme Court rulings that make it to the front page or are discussed uh, at great length and in, in, in mm -hmm. broadcasting, and and uh, those are not about hot button issues around which the country is uh, is, is is divided. Uh, but certainly before the uh, the, the Dobbs decision, mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of people could have picked the 
the votes as, as you know which way they were going to go w without any great familiarity with the of the methodology of those of those justices so it, it perhaps perhaps the 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 political dimension is much stronger in what are very big political issues that happen to come before the court hardly the don't know the yeah, that's a good that's a good question too but I'll say, w w even with Dobbs, I mean, I know Dobbs is the one, I dissented in Dobbs, I dissented in the gun case. Um, so I didn't think they were right. But I more or less asked people in part, I haven't said they're right. I think they're wrong. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. when you are trying to find out the other person's point of view, and when you would like to convince the other person, you first have to understand where they're coming from. And you have to take it on the merits and then say on the merits, why do I think it's wrong? Yeah. That means, and that's what I certainly tell the fifth graders if I can get their attention back from the snails. <laughs> <laughs> and I do. Uh, <laughs> They'll say, well, I, well but. This is, this is a, a question. I, I'm not in the fifth grade. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm old I know, enough I to, want to tell them. I want to tell them you have to, that, and Abraham Lincoln said that. I said two yeah. things that, Ab that uh, uh, I think John Stuart Mill started with this, that you better, and I know because I worked for Senator Ted Kennedy for mm -hmm. quite a while, and uh, what he would say, and this is what I want to tell at least the high school students, he'd say, you, you want to get something through and we're meeting some opposition and not everybody agrees with us and we have a point of view and we're trying to see how far we can get and so forth. The first thing to do is remember that credit is a weapon. So what you do is you find someone who really disagrees with you mm -hmm. and is an intelligent person and you can find them. And then you sit down and you talk about it and find out what their point of view is. Wait, don't talk too much. Listen, listen to what they're saying. And if they talk long enough, lo and behold, they will say something you actually agree with. And when they say something you actually agree with, you say, what a good point you have. <laughs> and then you try to work with that. And if you can get 30% of what you want, take it. Don't hold <laughs> out for 100% of what you don't get. And all your followers say, oh, you're a big hero. Don't be a big hero. Get the 30%. And he said that quite a lot. And quite often I would hear him when we did get something and, and the press is there and they'd say, oh, Senator Kennedy, you did such a good job getting this bill through, and he'd say, don't thank me, thank Orrin Hatch, the Republican, who mm -hmm, came mm -hmm. up with the idea mm -hmm. that allowed us to get together. I said, remember that. He'd tell us, hey, if you're a success, even 30%, 20%, you get something there, there's plenty of credit to go around. And if you don't get anything, who wants the credit? Mm -hmm. and, and that is a, a very, very good approach to keep that in mind when you are working with three or four or five or six or seven or eight or nine or 800 people mm -hmm. who don't think the way you do. First, listen to them. So get out there and start listening and start asking <laughs> questions and discussing. And All that's right, my I, point. Well, I'll ask you a question right now. Uh, it's, a, it's a question about uh, about well, it goes back to what something that bothered me about Roe versus Wade for for a long time. I'm old enough to remember when the New York State Legislature legalized abortion, mm -hmm. and in fact, many years after that, I got to interview the assemblyman who really cast the deciding vote to to put it over the top. Uh, he he believed in in legalizing abortion, but he was going to vote against it because he felt it would cost him his seat, mm -hmm. and his uh, his daughter-in-law. Uh, told him that she would never speak to him again if he voted mm. insincerely and uh, prevented abortion reform. And under that pressure, and he was—he was a very interesting character. I think he was a war hero and a, a Democratic assemblyman. Uh, he cast a vote in favor of legalization, saying that it would probably cost him his career, and it did, and it did. Mm. Uh, and uh, a couple of more states legalized abortion, and then we had Roe versus Wade. Uh, and it always struck me that uh, the court had, in a way, removed a lot of pressure from legislators, uh, uh, helping them avoid a very, very difficult vote uh, by saying, don't worry, we've got your back. This, this unelected body of the federal government has decided it. It's a right. Uh, and um, therefore, you can go on having demonstrations or protests, but uh, you don't have to ever take a vote on this again. 
I, I guess the only thing similar to that in recent years was same-sex marriage. But but is there is there sometimes merit in in letting an argument develop more in, in the country or letting mm -hmm. letting a, a side grow before the court steps in and lets people feel that they've been big brothered? Well, I I I don't know if you read or not. Linda Greenhouse wrote a pretty I thought a good book on on uh, abortion and its history and the history of. Uh, of uh, abolishing it, or making it unlawful, or making or making it lawful, or whatever. Right. Uh, but she got Harry Blackman's uh, uh, papers from mm -hmm. the Library of Congress, and it was pretty thorough. And I ended up thinking that maybe Harry Blackman was supposed to write an opinion, uh, which would have said that uh, the reason that in the case Roe v. Wade that the Texas law there was unconstitutional was because there was nothing in it that would allow an abortion when a woman needed an abortion to save her life. And if that had been the ground for the opinion, mm -hmm. there would have been a better opinion in many people's opinion. And most abortion laws in most states would have been struck down mm -hmm. anyway. And then mm -hmm. the people who were for making, who were the right to life people would have had to get them passed. <laughs> Uh, and maybe not many would have been passed. That would have been a whole different world. So I yeah. asked her once, would that have been a better, would, would it have been better if they'd done that or not? I think she thinks not, but I'm not sure. You'd have to ask her. Yeah. Yeah, and was, Ruth Ginsburg and various others had, had written, uh, this is not uh, yeah. such a, a great thing. But then they came along with a second case, KCV Polino, which I think is better reasoned, in, in my opinion. And uh, 50 years. There's a lot to be said for what you say, but you wouldn't say it about the um, um, uh, desegregation. You wouldn't say it about Jim Crow, I well, don't de think. De Although I came close to saying that about Jim yes. Crow. It was quite interesting. Well, um, I, I, I'd like to hear it because um, I, I, when I think of Brown v. Board of Ed, which was, I guess, probably the first Supreme Court mm -hmm. ruling I'd heard of as a, as a mm -hmm. person, <laughs> as a child, uh, and is this great landmark moment in, 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 in America, I tried to figure out what theory of reasoning would lead one to uh, the unanimous opinion of the court in Brown versus Board of Ed. Uh, equal protection of the law, that's what it says. And they knew perfectly well, people began to realize after World War II that in the yeah. South, Jim Crow meant no equal protection. Yeah. And, and so the reasoning was fairly simple. And what's a very interesting thing to do is mm -hmm. once I read Thurgood Marshall's argument to the court, his oral argument, Mm -hmm. uh, and it said very little about whether Jim Crow was constitutional or not. It more or less assumed that every judge thought that it was unconstitutional. So what did he talk about? He talked about whether people would follow it. He talked about whether they could get it enforced. Mm -hmm. And even when I was a law clerk in 64, it was not fully enforced. I mean, you can mm -hmm. find problems mm -hmm. today, but I mean, mm -hmm. the, the, it was not fully enforced at all. And uh, so when I talked about that, I, I, I've talked about it, I've written about it. Uh, Cooper versus Aaron. So uh, the State Department once sent over a Russian Air Force general to the court and they phoned up and somebody said, please be nice to him because he's turned all the missiles the other way. They're not pointed at the United States anymore. <laughs> and so he, he was a nice guy. I, he said, what's your favorite case? I said, Cooper versus Aaron. Hmm. Why? Yeah. Because what happened? Nobody helped the court try to enforce uh, 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 Brown. I can remember and probably you can mm -hmm. impeach Earl Warren. All mm -hmm. over the South? All, all, and, in Pennsylvania uh, as well. I, I saw it in rural Pennsylvania, by the way. Yeah. All right. So uh, 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 what happened in 1950? It was 1954, mm -hmm. uh, Brown. In 1955, what happened? Nothing. Nothing. 1956? Nothing. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until 1957 that a judge in Little Rock issued an order saying integrate Central High School. Mm-hmm. And when the time came in September of 1957, for those nine black students, pretty brave, the Little Rock Nine, to go out to Central High School, they went out. But it was surrounded by the White Citizens Council, yeah. and uh, who were all supporting Governor Faubus. 
And they wouldn't let the children in the school. And there was a fame of journalists from all over the world. Mm -hmm. I can remember that. And, yeah. and the picture of Elizabeth Eckford turned this way with the book in her hand, black girl. Mm -hmm. And behind her, Hazel Bryant, a white girl in the school whose face was contorted with rage mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. the thought of a black girl going into that white high school. All right, nightmare. But Hayes Brooks, who was the congressman from Little Rock, arranged a meeting between Governor Faubus and Eisenhower. Faubus went up to Newport, where he was, and told Eisenhower he'd integrate. He'd let them integrate the school. And uh, he went out and told the press the opposite. The opposite. Eisenhower mm -hmm. was pretty angry. Mm -hmm. So what should he do? What should he do? Um, um, he asked Jimmy Burns, who'd been on the court, resigned during World War II to run our war effort uh, at home. Uh, moderate, quote, governor of, of uh, uh, South, South, Carolina. South Carolina, was he? Uh, yeah. Jimmy Burns said, don't, if you send troops, he said to Eisenhower, you're going to have to uh, uh, start another reconstruction. You're going to have to occupy the South. Are you ready to do that? The best that will happen is they'll close all the schools and nobody will get any education. Yeah. But Brownell, Herbert Brownell, who was his wise counselor, said to Eisenhower, you've got to send troops. And that was when Eisenhower did send, I think, a thousand troops of the 101st Airborne. And we all knew at that time, the 101st Airborne, were, they were the, 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 the paratroopers who'd gotten hung up on the steeples in Normandy, Normandy and been shut yes, down yeah. uh, in World War II. And the heroes of the Battle of the Bulge. Eisenhower was a good politician and he knew who to send. And th those troops took those black children by the hand and walked into that white school. All right, and they stayed there. Ah, I'd like to end the story, I tell the class right now and say, what a great victory. Ah, but I can't end the story because the troops couldn't stay there forever. And when they left, Governor, the White Citizens Council, which had the control of the school board, said, close the school, no more integration. Yeah. And uh, there was a law case and it went up to the Supreme Court. And that was Cooper versus Aaron. And in mm -hmm. Cooper versus Aaron, all nine justices signed the opinion and said, you integrate, integrate, go back to integration now. But I asked the class, hey, wait a minute. How many did I say? Nine? Nine, yes. Yeah, nine. Oh, well, maybe there could have been 900 or 9,000. <laughs> but they're judges and there are a lot more people down there. And what happened was the day after the Supreme Court decided Cooper versus Aaron, Governor Faubus closed the school. And the school stayed closed for almost a year. Read David Margolik's book about yeah. how white yeah. and black child alike suffered during that year, suffered. But I say, see, it has a terrible, sad ending. Ah, ah but in my own view, this is just my own view, it was too late for the segregationists. Because why? Well, because that was the era of Martin Luther King, and we had the Freedom Riders, and we had the uh, uh, we had Rosa Parks. Uh, the word had gotten around to the North, and people yes. had awakened to the fact that Jim Crow was terrible, and and people suffered enormously because of it. And they went down to the South, and the public opinion after World War II, and even more after Cooper versus Aaron, and so forth, had changed so that the country woke up and did not want that yeah. segregated society down there as part of the United States. So now it's a long lead up, but I asked Vernon <laughs> Jordan the very question you asked. I went to great civil rights leader Vernon Jordan at that time, and I said to him, Vernon, we were talking about this subject as roughly as we've been discussing, and I said, well, do you think Brown versus Board did anything? I said, look, the country had to awaken to get it enforced. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't that have happened anyway? And did we did it really make a difference? Well, he said to me, don't be ridiculous. Of course it made a difference. <laughs> he said, of course it made a difference. It was at least a catalyst, at least, and probably more than that. But it took a long time. Yeah. I tell this story. I told this story to a woman who was president of the court, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Ghana. And she had asked me the question, uh, she was rather strong on civil rights and wanted to say, move in that direction. And, and uh, she asked me, why do people in the United States do what you say? She asked me that question in my office mm -hmm. in the Supreme mm -hmm. Court. 
mm-hmm. and I had to tell her a few stories. Mm-hmm. And I had to tell her stories when they didn't. Yeah. I had to tell her stories when of, of the Cherokee Indians and when they didn't. Yes. And when the president of the United States didn't and just said John Marshall made his decision, let him enforce it, da, da, da. But there's a long history. And the upshot of that history is uh, you, rule of law means that people will follow cases that they think are wrong. And maybe they're right. Maybe the cases are wrong. Yes. Don't have it. If you do not have some kind of a rule of law, it looks as if the situation could be worse. You see what you've opened up with that? And that's oh, why I have yes. a good answer. What, right? <laughs> very, very good answer. Uh, you, you remind me of a question you pose uh, toward the end of your book, which is, uh, uh, are we at a uh, uh, moment of paradigm shift? Uh, you were just describing the Warren Court and, and a paradigm shift that, that, that took place after World War II, after, after the world had gotten a real good look of what... Uh, racism and authoritarianism can can lead to uh, a prior paradigm shift was when the supreme court stopped blocking all the franklin roosevelt's uh, proposals for the new deal and practiced judicial restraint instead and and the first paradigm shift you mentioned is uh, at the beginning of the 20th century when the court always uh, decided to defer to contracts uh, uh, if, you know rather than a state law that might uh, guarantee some labor rights to uh, to workers in each, and at that time, as, as you write, the economy was booming. Uh, there was a, you could understand why the court was so pro-business because the business of America was business at that, yes. at, 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 at that time, as they said. Uh, one can understand why the Supreme Court practiced ju- judicial restraint when it did because it was being threatened with you know, being packed and uh, being caricatured as nine old men and all that. Uh, and you just described the, the third one. If this indeed is a paradigm shift, if, if there is, and you have chapters arguing, yes, it is, no, it won't. So you 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 examine this question with both uh, both poth- both possible answers. If, if if we are at a paradigm shift, uh, where's the what, what's the real world thing comparable to the booming American an economy of the twentieth century or the, the the depression or or the, the experience of the Second World War and coming to grips with, with American racial inequality. What is it that's happening that would be the uh, real world context of a paradigm shift toward uh, textualism or, or uh, original, uh, originalism? Well, that's a $64 question, isn't it? <laughs> I, I mean, uh, what is going on in the world yes, now? Yes, yes. And people think different things, and I don't have a better view than anyone else. But the the you you think that some people think that the uh, where we were going uh, uh, globalization, we thought globalization, free markets, globalization, uh, and, and at least before two thousand and eight, and America had a secret here. We were fabulous at it. We could go stop. Remember the uh, the the movie about uh, uh, the slum in uh, Bombay. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So was it Slumdog? Whatever it was, and we million, thought yeah. we're going to cure that because we are going to have an investment that will build up those those. And we we thought primarily about the changes in communication, about the changes in transportation, about business being here, there, and the other place, and that we were going to uh, have uh, more and more people get wealthier and wealthier across the world, and it was going to be absolutely fabulous. But somehow the transfer of that wealth to people who were frightened because they were worse off. Mm -hmm. They were frightened. And will we have the job? Will we be able to be sure our children will? Will we be able to be certain that our children won't watch too many Hollywood movies? And so as a result of not watching too many, they will be able to raise decent families? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Will we, you you know, the the, the Mm -hmm. litany over here. Maybe that's a big shift. I don't know. So textualism no, if would, it be, is, would textualism be, be a no, response well, to the could, fear of change? It could. Let, let's, it, let's go back it to the could. what Framer keep, said. Or a, yeah, keep the judges away from what's going on. It could. Yeah. And what, but I, I, those are questions I, don't, I can't answer. So what I put in here mm-hmm. is not some great theory, which I don't have, of what's going on. But I say, let's look at, on the no side, I said, let's look at those four promises. Promise one, it's simple, just read it. I say, ah, yeah. oh, I see, just read it. Well, you haven't then seen too many cases in the Supreme Court. We had a case 
Look, you, you, if you have a, a child who's handicapped, uh, the federal law says they have to give that child a good education anyway and appropriate and so forth. And if you don't think so, you can go to court. And if you win in court, you get your, quote, costs, yeah. end quote. No, well, we had a case. The woman went through all those steps. She won, she won, she won. And she said, I would like the cost of my educational expert, 29000 Well, does costs include educational expert? Or is cost just legal costs and lawyers? And, Let's and, see. And, uh, well, and, look at the word. Right. Look at the word. The word is cost. Oh, cost. I see. Now, say it twice. Cost, cost. <laughs> say it three <laughs> times. Cost, cost, cost. You think you got the answer? And that's yeah, yeah. an easy one. Yeah. That's yeah. an easy one. Yeah. So it's not quite so simple. And, and the, edu the, the, the educational expert, as I recall, had been uh, essential to the woman making the required course. case yes. in order to... Uh, yes. to, to have her the yes. her, her child have the right yes. to an education. Yes. Yeah. Well, I can give you because I put in here. I give you fifteen cases that are yes. far yes. more difficult than that. Well, uh, any other law enforcement officer does that include uh, officers on the traffic beat, or does it mean policemen, or does it mean customs? I say, well, let's say it five, fifteen times and see if we get any closer. Of course we don't. <laughs> and uh, there are some other things that they put in there. They're not, they understand that. But, but it's not so simple. And let's look at the real thing that moved the people at the beginning of your questioning to and you towards saying it's not so bad textualism. It will keep these judges under control. Yeah. I say it will. It will. It's going to keep them under control. I see. They won't be able to substitute what they think is good or bad for the law. Now, let's go back to Dobbs. I mean, I joined an opinion in Dobbs that had about 15 reasons why it was wrong. But right. let's take one of them. Where did you get the idea, Mr. Textualist, that you could overrule Roe and that you could overrule Casey? Where did you get that idea? Why? Did you overrule them because they didn't use a textualist or originalist method? No. If you're going to overrule all cases that don't use that, you're going to overrule every case because mm -hmm. there are very few, very mm -hmm. few that use that method in the Supreme Court until very recently. Well, then why did you overrule it? What was your argument? Your argument was it was wrongly decided. Ah, I see. It was very wrongly decided. Is that your point? Yes. Very wrongly decided. I see. That's your point. Okay. So you, the judge, have to decide whether an earlier case was very wrongly decided. Mm -hmm. I see. And that doesn't give you an opportunity to substitute what you think is good or bad for the law. Right. Right. The same opportunity you accused me of having. Let's face the facts that whether you're a good judge or not and honest and try to keep your own opinion about what's good or bad, etc., somewhat out of it, except where it's supposed to be there. Yeah. But, but, but uh, hey, that's the same problem for all methods. Right. And uh, so, please, you see what I want to say there? I want to say the big moving force in this not becoming a paradigm shift is the judges who thought this was so great that they become extreme at it will be there for a while and they'll see a lot of cases and they will see that it doesn't work quite as well as they thought, <laughs> that maybe they won't get those wonderful answers yeah. they thought they would get. And that I think it and that's why I've written this as a. Uh, a dispassionate, though of course I feel it, <laughs> but mm -hmm. as a dispassionate, legal, uh, factual, uh, maybe some interest in it, uh, arguments, not just saying, oh, it's all politics. Yeah. Because it isn't. I want to uh, I want to convince them that this is wrong and that I'm doing my best there. I was reminded at one point in, in the book of something that uh, Senator Michael Bennett uh, told me in an interview after he met with uh, the then nominee to the Supreme Court, Justice Gorsuch, who is uh, very much a textualist. And, uh, and Bennett, uh, Colorado, he was a Coloradoan, and this was a Colorado Democrat, the senator. So he'd, he, he would been, he, I think he'd, he thought he was expected to at least give him the courtesy of an interview and considered voting for him, yeah. but decided not to. And he said, he said, you know, uh, when I became a senator, uh, so that made me rethink the value of the text of laws, because I now see the method by which a law is written uh, overnight by staff, uh, uh, you know, compromises over this word and that at the last minute. Uh, and he said to to invest that that very improvisational 
process with with a kind of a, a you know mosaic uh, eternal value it just made no sense to him you were staff you were you you were staff of the senate senate committee uh, and uh, you recall when you was it chief justice rehnquist who who called you up uh, to get a, a read on a, a, no, a burger burger oh it was chief justice burger who, who uh, uh, called up to get a, a clarity and what something meant in a law what the intent was knowing that that's something that Senate staff. No, he, he just had somebody. He, he had some point he wanted to make on something. And my point there is he called me because no senators were going to take the call. And I my see. point there is yeah. that these institutions are in different time frames. Yeah, they, they work in very different ways. And I understand that one of the arguments of the textualist is to say, oh, look, you're just following what some staff person uh, said. That shouldn't be the law. What the senator says should be the law. I say, you don't understand how we worked it. Yeah, you don't yeah. understand how it works. Uh, General Motors has staff. The president doesn't put the bolts on. And uh, when you when a law follows, uh, it doesn't always. But uh, when uh, uh, the procedure is, is what it used to be, and it's normal and probably still pretty normal now, even even despite the criticisms, uh, you have hearings. You have hearings and they take can take months yeah. or weeks. And uh, uh, you are uh, the lobbyists are fair as long as you have lobbyists for both sides mm -hmm. and all sides and you get these criticisms and those criticisms and the other criticisms and the staff tries to write something or put something together that will be coherent and they write a report and the report is first circulated to staff and the staff person for all the senators all 17 on the judiciary committee and they read it, the senators, or their staff reads it. But it's the job of the staff person, yes. if this is a serious, controverted matter, to tell, explain it to the senator. Yeah. They have to understand what, read a lot of those laws that are changed. They say, paragraph 92 of A1B of statute number so-and-so is changed. The word X is now changed to Y, okay? I mean, mm -hmm. hey. Uh, the se Senator Bennett's not going to see what's going on there unless right. he has somebody explaining it to him, which he does. And right. if he wants to write a dissent, he writes a dissent. And if he wants to write a concurrence in the opinion, he writes a concurrence. And nobody thinks that that report is the law. What they think it will help, it will help a judge sometimes work out what the mischief was that they were after. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, there are other things. There are statements on the floor. I will use a lot. I want to find out what they're after. And very often, it's as Senator Bennett described it, where it was a big mess and just fighting. Well, yeah. You learn that pretty quickly, and you read the report, and you read what was going on, and you say, forget it. It's not going to help me in this case. So but, it requires... But, but, but what, the, the judge has to do his job, right. and the job is to try to find out what they were after. And right. if they're after two contradictory things, or it is just a staff person or a lobbyist, and there are other people will tell you, hey, that's the U.S. Steel Company's lobbyist that put that in, and it's meaningless mm -hmm. and does harm. Okay, mm -hmm. we'll learn that. We yeah. have a lot of briefs, and it doesn't always work perfectly. So it's like any other thing where you have a problem of, hey, what did they mean by animals? What did they mean? I mean, how are we going to find out? And sometimes you will find out, and sometimes you won't find out. And so the traditional way of going about it is look. Don't tell the judge not to look. And if the judge is honest, as I hope they are, if you weren't honest, I don't know why you took that job. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> not, you know, but, but, but uh, uh, hey, uh, you learn something from those reports, from those discussions, from those floor statements, from those hearings, uh, from about what's going on and what are they trying to do? Yeah, use it. Yeah. And if you don't I, learn I, anything, forget it. I was surprised to learn, not not being a Supreme Court uh, uh, car, never having been a Supreme Court correspondent or or, or a lawyer for that matter. Oh, I, I was surprised to learn that legislative history is uh, looking at the legislative history of something when it's a law is uh, is out of fashion and and that yes, uh, it's the same. It's all part of the same thing. It's all it's part, all of, the part same. of the same thing. That's that's on the side. Say, just look at the words. 
please spare yeah. me. The Just legislative the history words. would be looking at the wh why look at the third draft of something when we have the final draft here, if we have the finished. But that isn't uh, what the legislative right, history right, is. Right, That's right. part of it. Yeah. That's part of it. And as I say, sometimes it's useless. Yes. And sometimes it is not. Do you and think there are other that things to look at too? I yes. mean, there are a lot of things. That, yeah. Let me let me move move the discussion in, in a different direction yeah. for a moment. Yeah. Uh, when you sat on the Supreme Court, uh, did you have the greatest job that you could possibly ever have imagined having in your life, or is there something else? That would have been uh, even even more wonderful. Was there some other ambition? Not for me. Uh, no, not for me. But you have to like deciding. You have to like the law. You have to like the cases. You have to like deciding things. And I now think, at going back to teaching, I mean, the professors have a good job. It's fun teaching students, and you have to really learn something. What you learn is mostly about the past. A lot of it. Mm -hmm. What did this case mean? What did that case mean? So forth. When you're a judge, you have to decide. You don't. You won't know as much as the scholars, etc., about the past. Mm -hmm. But you will have to worry about how your decision is going to affect the present and possibly the future. Great concurring opinion by Justice Harlan in Poe v. Omen, and he says how you look to the values of the past, often here and in cases describing this. But you also are deciding if it's a case that's one of the thirty percent that are right pretty visible and so important how is it affecting us now yeah. how what is going to happen in the future what kind of channel are we opening up pretty abstract pretty vague but it's there it's there more than in other jobs it, 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 and i was also because this is a common misconception a president told me this he said um, you know he said the applause dies away much faster than you think mm -hmm. and you're left with the job so you better like it <laughs> and indeed that is the value i mean mm -hmm. what is it like in the in terms of, look i'm there two or three years group of young lawyers having some kind of reception i go over to the reception one comes justice Breyer. oh i love your opinions they're terrific would you assign my program so of course so as he turns away he turns to his friend with the program and says, that makes four. <laughs> uh, well, one more case I want to ask you about. Uh, you've mentioned it already, which was the Heller uh, case of the DC law that uh, banned uh, unlicensed handguns in the, in the home. And the, uh, there was a, a, a five to four decision, in which you, were, you signed on to the minority of the four. Uh, which was really argued on on uh, originalist grounds on both sides. Yeah, I think both they were arguing about, and I remember reading the uh, dissent uh, by Stevens, I guess, which I thought was really quite brilliant in how the uh, the phrases uh, about uh, the need for a militia and um, uh, the right to bear arms were conjoined in the legal discourse of the time when 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 the Second Amendment was drafted, and that they uh, they there this was not just a random pair of phrases. But in addition to, to signing on to the Stevens dissent, you also wrote your own uh, dissent. Uh, and you say in the book, I'm, I'm not sure if this is in the dissent, but you say uh, as a hypothetical at least, even if you were convinced that the intent of the Second Amendment had been to protect uh, people to arm themselves in their homes and protect themselves with, with firearms, even so, based on the consequences of the proliferation of, of handguns uh, in the District of Columbia, you would, have, you would have voted to support that law, conceding the fact that it was in d direct violation in that case of, of, of what was intended by the Second Amendment. And, and I, I, I was, uh, you know, I'm, I was un un unhappy with the result of, the, um, of, of Heller, but, um, but I wondered in that case, when, what if somebody said, well, I... When, when the freedom of the press was included in the First Amendment, I know the press was pretty raucous and uh, you know, it wasn't exactly Pulitzer Prize winning stuff uh, being written and very partisan. Uh, so we can, uh, we, we, we can ignore whatever the intent was because things are, un, things are uncivil and, and the, uh, things in, in various kinds of media drive people to violence. Let's, let's crack that down on things. Should, do we owe anything to the intent of the, of, of the authors of these old, old uh, 
parts we of the do. Constitution. We do. What I'm trying to do in, in what you're thinking of is suppose you as a reporter mm -hmm. learn fact X and you decide to print X knowing that if you print X, 10,000 American soldiers will be killed the next day. Mm -hmm. Would you do it? Uh, I'm, no. I'm, I'm pretty sure that my editor would see to it that I would not do it, yes. Yes, correct. Yes. And if somebody did something like that or tried to, uh, that might violate the law. You see, freedom of speech, the freedom of speech doesn't define itself. Yes. And what I'm saying in that part of the opinion is if we're really going to have something such as the right to bear arms mean that you can keep a pillow and under the pillow is a gun in your house, even if it means something like that, mm -hmm. maybe you can't keep a um, artillery piece, right. <laughs> or maybe you can't keep it loaded, or maybe you can't have certain kinds of munition, and there'll be all kinds of questions, and how will we solve those questions? And my answer is to how we solve those questions, if we have them, which I didn't want us to have. Yeah. But the way to solve them is as we do with First Amendment, press, speech, Certainly with Fourth Amendment, unreasonable searches and seizures, you look to a law that's challenged. To what extent will that law protect a critical or a very important or an important government interest like saving lives that cannot be protected in a less restrictive way? And you also look to see whether it impinges, to what extent mm -hmm. does it interfere with your right to a free press or to free speech or to uh, have something in your house. You see, you balance and weigh, and that happens all the time in other amendments, and I was saying that's what we'd have to use here, and I happened to not have a piece of paper in front of me which told me mm -hmm. uh, exactly what the citation was, that at the time that the Constitution was passed in Massachusetts, where I am at this moment, you could keep a gun under your pillow, mm -hmm. but it couldn't be loaded mm -hmm. because the law said every evening all of the ammunition has to be in a central storage place outside your house, but somewhere downtown, I don't know the address. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay? You see? So there are a lot of different laws, and you have to have a way of going about it. Of course, what I basically believed is, presumably, uh, from what you've said, you just said that Stevens was right, what this was about. So mm -hmm. I would have used history, but I came to a different conclusion about history. What Stevens said, it says, a well-regulated militia, Mm -hmm. being necessary for the security of a free sp state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Okay? What Stephen says that was about is read Article I of the Constitution, and you will see that Congress had the power to call up and regulate state militias. Who were the state militias? They just won the Revolutionary War mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for the United States. And people were frightened that Congress might call them up, regulate them, and the regulation would say disband them. And those who were against ratifying the Constitution, some of them went around and say, see, if you ratify this, this is what's going to happen. And Madison, who was, no, who was an intelligent guy and was not an idiot, he mm -hmm. said, do not worry. Don't listen to those people. I will put an amendment in the Bill of Rights which will say Congress can't do that. Yeah. So what this amendment is about, it is about... Congress being unable to disband the state militia. It is not about your being able to keep a gun under your pillow. Uh, or you say, now, there, if we lost five to four on that one. Yeah. But I yeah. cannot resist saying, among the many other things I've not resisted saying, <laughs> but I, can, I cannot resist saying that uh, uh, in the next two cases, in Bruin, in the case uh, in 19... In uh, 2022, a group of linguistic professors filed a brief in which they said, we have done research and we have discovered in 1720 through 1760 or something like that, 
In those years, we found 120,000 references to the words bear arms, and they all, or almost all, referred to the militia. Yeah. So that's what this was about. That's not the majority, is it the majority, but that's a different issue. And I wouldn't yeah. say never use history. History might be very helpful. But remember this when you use history. When we go back to see what the ordinary person thought these words meant in 1788 or, or uh, 1869, there happened to be about more than half the country that did not participate in politics right. at that time. Yeah. Because women were not allowed to vote. Right. And there was still slavery. And so the political group uh, that is giving their idea of what this is, is uh, perhaps somewhat different than it is now. Well, Justice Breyer, I want to hand off to Suzanne uh, Borden in case she has some questions for you that, uh, uh, and I hope, I hope. Yep, Th thank you very much for oh, thank you. a thank conversation. You very much. It's very for wonderful yeah. conversation. We do need to wrap up, um, but I do want to uh, sneak in one question here. Um, we live in a, a all or nothing culture these days and not so much of a 30% culture and, and compromise. Um, how do we get people, particularly young people, to understand the importance of what you were talking about earlier, um, especially in their lifetime when they haven't really witnessed much compromise on the political stage? Well, uh, the thing that makes me more optimistic is I, I did describe just a few minutes ago what I tell the students mm -hmm. about listening to people who disagree, about participating in public life, about at least voting, but I don't say it to them the way I just said it to you. This is how I say it. I say, um, somebody will say, what do you think we should do? Just like you did. What do you think, what, what should we do? And the first thing I say is, why do you ask me? I say, I, it's not my world. It's your country. You're the ones who are going to have to figure this out. See, that, they immediately get on my side, of course, <laughs> when I say that. But I mean, yes. But then suddenly, when we're talking about what Senator Kennedy said and what John Stuart Mill said about listening to other people, about participation, um, I might add, it depends on the mood, it depends on the mood, but I might add, Derek Bach quoted in his book about education, uh, and I don't know if it's, I don't know if it really happened or not, but Pericles, in his famous oracle, uh, a funeral oration in Athens 2,000 years ago, said, among other things, what do we say in Athens about a person who does not participate in public life? We, don't, we do not say he is a man who minds his own business. We say he is a man who has no business here. Mm -hmm. Now, the optimistic part, when I go into this speech, as you can see, I've said it before, but they get interested. I can see in the eyes of the students, at least I believe I can, I can see something that says, huh, this is sort of interesting. I've been looking for what I can do. I've wondered about it. Maybe I can. And then if anything like that comes up in the conversation, I say, yes, you can. <laughs> yes, we can. We're not so bad in this country. A few people getting together and seeing if old people need something at the time of COVID. A few people getting together who don't even know each other and seeing if there's somebody over here who needs some help during an accident. When a bridge breaks or something happens, we're not so bad at that. And so look at that side of the American experience. And look at the values that we put in this document, this document which John Marshall said must last and see us through problems that we can now see dimly, if at all. You see? That's what he thinks. And those kids who I'm talking to, I think they think it. I think they will think it. It's a question of bringing it out, and they're the ones that have to bring it out, and you have to point that out to them. And, and when we do, as I think we do, not so bad. Great. Well, thank you, Justice Breyer. Thank you, yes, Robert. Thank Just you. to remind everybody, uh, Justice Breyer's book is called Reading the Constitution, Why I Chose Pragmatism, Not Textualism. I'll be sending out a follow-up email that will include a link to the book. Uh, please remember to go to momentmag.com where you can register for this week's program on Thursday, as well as our programs coming up. Again, thank you, everybody, for joining us, and we'll see everybody next time. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Suzanne.
And thank you. That was, good. That was great. Thank you. Bud. I enjoyed it. It was very nice to talk with you. I enjoyed it. Thank good. you.